Thanks, Mike. Uh, Governor, Premier, Leader of the Opposition, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, I've really drawn the short straw, haven't I? Uh, I've got the, the shift after lunch, uh, and I also got, got given the subject of uh, the global economy, so uh, just a couple of little challenges for me. And I must say, I, uh, my state manager, Joe Formicello, made me feel even more confident as we were walking down, because first of all, he said, I didn't know you were speaking. And, and then I said, well, I'm, I'm talking about the global economy, and he, he stops. And he says, just, just in case you don't know, you do know that the official cash rate went down by 25 basis points earlier this week. Um, so I felt very confident about how I was going to go today. So... <laughs> um, in regard to the change of the half-hour time difference, uh, Premier, I, I think that's an excellent idea. I might finally turn up at a meeting on the Eastern Board on time, so <laughs> I think everybody over there would love to see me turning up at the right time instead of turning the clock the wrong way. Um, it is a pleasure to talk today, uh, and my subject is the global economy. Um, first of all, I do have to comment that uh, we at Bendigo and Adelaide Bank are proudly investing in South Australia and very keen to continue to support the local economy. Um, just touching on the 25 basis point reduction earlier this week, um, probably came, uh, certainly many commentators uh, were, were of the view that perhaps we should remain where we were, uh, others suggesting that it is appropriate. Um, certainly Glenn Stevens and the RBA will be coming out tomorrow with a statement uh, reforecasting their, their growth and inflation forecasts. I think that's going to be very interesting, but uh, I think the initial commentary is around the fact that it is reasonable to conclude uh, that Australia is growing slower than what we were hoping uh, and that full employment or the full use of our resources in, in Australia isn't occurring, so we are trading a little bit under capacity, which is pushing our unemployment rate up a little bit higher than what we would prefer. Um, I now move towards the global economy um, and as a, a practical economist, being the Chief Risk Officer, uh, in other words, I'm not meant to take risks, uh, I can confidently observe uh, that the best observation I can make in regard to the short and medium term of the economy is that it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen. <laughs> um, quite simply, there are so many moving parts, including the unprecedented expansionary central bank monetary policy settings currently around in the world, that it really is very hard to work out where we're going to land. I found this slide, uh, and I'm not sure that you can read it all, but it, it actually provides a pretty succinct summary of some of the key areas, I think, around the globe that we may be interested in. I might just highlight a couple, if I may. Um, the first one is the one that the Premier spoke about, uh, China, an extraordinarily large economy. Um, there are some concerns that China's growth is slowing and that if this trend continues and dips below 7%, then internal economic concerns for China may surface. Whilst I think that's a reasonable view and one that we need to be aware of, I think we also have to recognise the substantial growth and urbanisation that has been happening in, in recent times in China. Clearly, as the economy grows, year-on-year year, percentage growth will be, continue to be hard because the aggregate economy will be bigger. Um, so we need to take that into account when we're looking at China. Um, but I suspect that the Chinese, have, as they have historically, will manage their economy appropriately in the short to medium term. When you go over there, you can actually see that there is some major infrastructure development still required and the urbanisation of their economy is quite extraordinary. Uh, I had some experiences earlier in my career, admittedly four or five years ago now, where I visited China on a regular basis. You go to Shanghai and there would be a whole precinct of new commercial buildings that had just been completed. There wouldn't be a soul around them. And you'd look at it and you go, how on earth can you build those, that new infrastructure and there is no sign of life? And, you know, with, with the values and the images that we have in our minds, you walk away concerned. Six months later, you go back there, it is completely full, it is thriving, there is a whole community, business community, performing and profitable in that area. It is quite an extraordinary event. And it gives you some sense of the size and the magnitude of that economy and also the opportunity that exists for us here in South Australia. I'll take you to Germany, um, which is the economic powerhouse of the EC. Um, and is certainly extremely internationally competitive while the euro st stays at the level that it is at the moment. And I can see that by the volume of German cars that most of you are driving around our streets at the moment. Um, it currently has the world's largest trade surplus. Um, 
which I find very interesting um, because when you look at the EC, and I think uh, Nigel spoke about this earlier, whilst Germany is succeeding in profiting from, from the EC, other countries like Greece, as, as Nigel said, are, seem to be socially struggling and it's going to be re really very interesting to see how the, the EEC manage their way through the next period of time. When you go to the UK, um, the headline, if you can read it, is that they've got a healthy economy but they are starting to suffer some housing price inflation, which is not dissimilar, I guess, in some ways to us, uh, some similar challenges. But when you stand back a little bit further, I'm not sure it is quite as similar because as a banker I spend a bit of time looking at the, the banking industry and their banking industry remains under stress um, and is still majority nationalised. And even only just the other day I noted that uh, I think it was Lloyds Bank have only just started commencing paying a dividend for the first time since 2008. My thought process there goes to the poor people who uh, put their superannuation funds into equities and were depending on dividends and have lived for all that time without a return and even now are facing a small return. That's the flip side of these low interest rates that we're seeing. To the US, um, and economic health is recovering quite well by the looks of it, uh, with their central bank starting to ponder how they stop QE and when do they start moving interest rates. Again, their banking industry is facing uh, continuing challenges whilst it looks healthy and fit. Their banking industry is substantially different to ours where they're fundamentally nationalised the, the, the home loan market by uh, Freddie Mac and, and Fannie Mae being the suppliers of funding for their housing industry. So a lot of their banks are fundamentally investment banks taking proprietary positions. So the challenge for them is to work out a regulatory environment that will manage that situation, which in turn will affect the rest of the world economy. The last one I'd like to just highlight is Japan. And uh, I know many people here perceive that they're not, they're not that old, but there are some of us here um, who can remember the late 1980s, early 90s, when Japan was a very strong powerhouse globally. Um, and you know, we're investing much in the way that China is beginning to invest around the world as, as well. Um, certainly their economy has slowed over a long period of time and it's been very interesting to watch how recently they've moved to an expansionary monetary policy to try and create economic wealth and to slow deflation in their, in their market. To date, I don't think it's worked um, and certainly the other central banks have started to respond by easing monetary policy. So as an experiment, not finished yet, but worth continuing to watch. So when you stand back and you look at that slide, um, what's it really telling us? I think it's really telling us that uh, what we're looking to uh, in the near future is slow global growth. So we're not going to go back to the, the, the accelerated growth before, before the GFC. And I think we need to structure ourselves and be prepared to work in that environment. So how do I think this plays out for South Australia? Uh, well, firstly, I don't believe in any way that we're immune to the global economic trends. And as a banker, I still have nightmares about when the ill winds of the GFC blew over our shores. Um, and I certainly don't wish to go through that period again any time soon. So all up, I think that we're going to have to accept that we're working in a global slow growth environment and we need to set our businesses so that we can do that. In South Australia, uh, it is fair probably to say that our, and, and I think it has been stated earlier today, that our, our growth rates have been somewhat below or a little bit below the mean average growth of Australia. What that is, to me, is a challenge. Um, and, I, and I also made this other comment here, which I think is very important. When you travel through Asia, you talk to people about Australia and they say, you are actually part of Asia. Uh, and I absolutely passionately agree with that. So there is a saying through Asia that when you have a challenge or you have danger, the tail of that is also opportunity. And I do think in South Australia we have a magnificent opportunity in front of us. Um, with our well-developed infrastructure, our skilled workforce and our strong education sector, I do remain very positive that we can renew and re rejuvenate our economy. The currency is coming back a little bit further. Um, uh, Glenn Stevens is, is still speaking about getting it down a little bit further and hopefully some of the actions he's taken recently have assisted with that. That makes our international competitive position better, so our ability to export, to take our goods and services to other parts of the, the globe and bring back economic wealth to our geographical region of influence is becoming easier for us and it is an opportunity for us uh, to start to try and work through those opportunities. Um, as a banker, I can say those things because I actually have a slightly different role to many people who are proprietors of new businesses. 
Uh, my role as a banker is to ensure that there are appropriate banking services, and that includes trade facilities, debt facilities, products and services that bankers provide. I need to make sure that they are freely available to support businesses expanding in South Australia. It is pleasing to say, and I am very proud to say, that Bendigo Bank has committed and invested into the South Australian market over recent times. Um, the most physical evidence of it is our $150 million uh, new headquarters in 80 Grenfell Street, which I think a lot of people have been to, but represents a terrific investment uh, from our company to this economic uh, area. Uh, we employ somewhere around 1,000 people in the building um, and are delighted to be part and contributing to South Australia. Um, we are actually doing other things as well. Uh, there is the non-physical world, uh, and Mike Smithson um, probably can assist you with this because I am probably one of the old people that don't understand these things. Um, but only this week uh, we, we launched a new product uh, which is called My Banker, uh, which is a digital service that provides up-to-date financial information and current information for people about, about the business environment and also ways to help them improve their businesses. And it's free. Um, now, the tricky bit for me um, is that when you have a look at it, uh, and I think it's an, an extraordinary service that provides really up-to-date information. For example, it told me uh, this morning that uh, the NAB had decreased their home loan rate by 25 basis points, so it's a, it's a, it's a quite a useful, up-to-date, real-time advice tool. Um, to be able to access it, uh, um, all you need to do, Mike, uh, if I get this wrong, can you help me? Um, I think you go to an app store. Uh, and there's some application down there, and then you do something else and it appears on your phone. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, uh, yeah, talk to Mike. Um, <laughs> so I will finish up, but I'd like to leave you with a, a final thought to ponder. Um, part of my life is I get to do many interesting and different things, and at the end of last year... Uh, I got to spend um, quite a bit of time with some people from the USA who are probably some of the leading thought leaders in that country. Um, it was a great honour to be there. It was fascinating. Their intellect was stunning. Um, the interesting conversation that we had was that we spent all our time talking about the, the next 10 or 20 years and what's on the horizon. And I, th I think this is worth pondering, but the conversation was all about the fact that we're on the cusp of a robotic revolution. Um, and that the way our economy, our real economy, is going to work is expected to materially change over the next 10 or 20 years. You know, will there be a bus driver? Will, we, will there be a taxi driver? There are some real economic impacts and considerations that we collectively have to think about that's coming through the pipeline. Um, fascinating conversation. Great thinkers. Interestingly enough, they didn't have the answers either. So I will leave it for you. Thank you. <laughs>